Hey folks. How's everyone doing? So the first stream of the week. Black Crab. Part 11. I think we're up to 11 now. A loose count. Yeah, a little bit of chocolate on there. Good taste. <sighs> well, what a fun week it's been. Friday now. I need to dust my desk or something. Crikey. It's a bit of a mess. Um... So yeah, it's been kind of fun this week, but boy, we had some hurdles. Um, oh, hello, Twinkles. Yes, hello. Are you back in? Are you going to say hello? Are you going to say hello? Oh, you're up. Oh, wait a It's rainy out there. Yeah, can we go through the door? Ah, Miss Twinkle made her first appearance of the night. Hmm. Oh, I'll do a recap, I think, probably first. Um, let me try and recall where we are, because I've been doing some work on stuff today as well. I think... Uh, my audio level's okay. They look good. Um, we had some real issues last night. Most of which were down to me having upgraded Windows Subsystem for Linux. Not this week, but like a week or two ago. I can't remember when exactly. I've been meaning to do it for a long time, but I've been putting it off. Because I knew it was going to cause problems always going to break stuff right so not only did i have to update uh, windows itself um with all the patches i also had to update windows subsystem for linux and then having done that i then had to update from ubuntu 18 to 20 or 1804 to 2004 i think it was and you can do that without reinstalling Ubuntu, funny enough. You can do it from within Ubuntu running on uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux, which I was kind of pleased about. Um, however, it's clearly managed to break a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, yesterday, the breakage we came across was Yosis didn't work anymore. Um, because that was built manually from scratch. It's not like it's a, an Ubuntu package that gets updated when you update Ubuntu or upgrade Ubuntu. Um, that was actually quite simple to upgrade. I mean, it takes a bit of time. It's quite a big compile because I tend to build from source. But um, the next issue I had was uh, an XPNR, and that was a lot more difficult. Because I'm running on Windows Subsystem for Linux, there are some fiery hoops that you have to kind of jump through in order to get an XPNR to build the way it needs to be built so it can run nicely on uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux. And I, for the life of me, I couldn't remember. I mean, if you just follow the instructions, uh, it doesn't give you anything specific for Windows Subsystem for Linux, but if you follow the Ubuntu instructions, it doesn't work. Um, you get a number of different issues. Um, plus, I had some new issues that I hadn't hit before, like it couldn't find the Python development staff, and oh, it was just one thing after another. But I did eventually get there. I know I left the stream last night, and it still wasn't working, but believe you me, I was up to about one last night, 
finishing it off, uh, getting that working, and then getting the basic example working as well that we're working on, which we'll come back to in a minute. So yeah, bit of a trial. Um, but that's the way these things go sometimes. Hold on. It's turned on here. I've got something turned on. Hi, Charm. Mixer. That's very strange. Parkable's not turned on. Let's turn that off. Just turning off any stuff that we don't need anymore. I don't know what those things are. Um, maybe I should... Uh, just before we start up, let me see if I can um, see the camera. The one. You make a few minor adjustments here. Um, with the camera. I'm going to need the camera to show you the board, so I've just been um, adjusting that. Um, damn, my other light's not... Um, Sorry, just making adjustments to my other camera. I will be with you all shortly. Uh, it's a bit bright actually. I wonder if I can just resolution, video, color space, color range, color space. Oh, can't I turn the brightness down? That's a little annoying to say the least. Bigger video, zoom, focus, aperture. Hmm. 
No. Nothing to work. Hmm. Makes no difference whatsoever. Oh, well, just have to put up with it as is, I'm afraid. Uh, hold on. Now we can see it. Look. I know the angle is not perfect and the brightness is not quite right, but it will do for the moment. Hmm. Right, how is everyone? Hi, Laurie, by the way. And welcome. Welcome, men, even. So let's review where we are, I guess. Um, so as I had mentioned earlier, I got the next P&R working at the end. Not at the end of last stream, but after the stream finished last night. Um, and I also got the um, the MMIGEN SPI slave working as well. So that's the one working. So we we'll go through that in a minute. So I've ticked off these items here. Um, we've got FPGA programming via soft SPI, um, the FPGA reprogramming. So we had to amend it so it would you could do it successively. Um, then we've got the NMIGEN slave driving the LEDs, or I got that working last night after the stream. Um, and we had the, and then this afternoon I was talking to Laurie, strangely enough, uh, on Discord. Um, because I'd been having problems. I had a version of this that was not compiling under the new version of Arctic. RTIC, which is a 0 0.6.0 version, which is where currently where it sits um, in the GitHub repository. Um, and quite a few things have changed between 5 and 6. And they're big enough changes that, given the choice, I wouldn't want to continue with the older version because it's quite different. But I didn't get past some fairly simple problems to do with um, the USB resources that are being shared. Um, and then uh, Laurie encouraged me to relook at it this afternoon. And Bob, your uncle, um, between us, we managed to crack it, which is cool. So that's now working, which is really good. So I can now work with um, what is going to be the next version of Arctic. Uh, in other words, skating to where the puck's going to be, rather than working with something I know that's wrong or different, and then having to convert it afterwards. Because it is difficult converting between the two. It's quite um, quite involved. Well, certainly my experience was, because I obviously... Uh, couldn't get it working properly 
but uh, so that's all working now so that's good so we're up to date here with this list um, one of the other things that we're left with is the FPGIO programming but using the quad SPI but I should I, I should show you guys this working as well because you might not have seen it let me show you the code first where we are um, after the changes so it's going to be in the new RTIC 0.6 version as well so let's go through that um, so what are the big changes with this okay there is a lot of changes um, so I've got the soft SPI that's the same that's sitting here above where the app is now the apps themselves have changed before if you remember they used the const app um, so that they could attach attributes to it that's all been overcome now and they actually do it as a mod you know as a module which is kind of cool so now you have this you still have your attributes at the top obviously but uh, they, they it's now supported with uh, mod attributes which is great um, the stuff that I'm taking is pretty much the same as before the only thing that's different is this um, because I'm spawning off soft tasks which I haven't showed you yet um, you have to provide an interrupt because it uses an interrupt to do that now normally you just provide an unused interrupt now in this case I'm not using the LP timer one that's probably not the best one to choose by the way because it might actually be useful but um, I need to go through the interrupts and work out uh, which one I can use here or which several if I do several different spawns because it uses these spare interrupts to create what's known as software tasks uh, using the scheduler and you can prioritize these tasks as well so it's very sophisticated in that sense very powerful got my tea as well my tea tastes slightly hot chocolatey because I had hot chocolate in this last night and I obviously didn't clean it out properly and left traces so I've got tea with a kind of very very faint taste of hot chocolate which is odd my goodness um, so anyhow so that's the first bit that you'll notice that's different okay and the fact that it's a mod the other thing now it's a mod is it doesn't confuse the ID as much um, but it also means that you have to pull in all the relevant use import type statements for the mod which is separate from the ones that you need outside so that was fun sorting that out um, and also some of them will be repeated so where you see this you have the this kind of hierarchy of um, access controls to do with crates crates are what rust the stations call uh, libraries uh, so I can import from the libraries that I've imported above by this term use crate um, in case you hadn't seen that before um, my resources here have changed slightly because now look I've got these added to my USB resources that I'm sharing so I initialize these in, in, in it and then pass them on to the hardware task interrupt task so these are new and these were the key to me solving the problem earlier this afternoon or the key to um, Laurie and I solving this problem this afternoon and there's a there's a couple of different ones you can use but these are the right ones this basically says if you want something that is really exclusively used for one task because resources what's in resources is normally shared between one or more tasks um, and that kind of includes in it but sometimes in it doesn't if you're just sharing it with in it there's a special kind of sharing going on because if you think about it in it can't be using it at the same time as the interrupt because in it configures it and passes it to the interrupt so it's not like two tasks like a soft task sharing it with another hardware task or two hardware tasks trying to share it um, so they have this this is one of two different extra descriptions that you can give or attributes that you can give to this resource that basically says uh, because you're calling it a task local i.e. it's exclusive to a particular task 
apart from it may also be initialized in init um, you won't need a lock uh, when you use that resource because one of the changes between the 0 0.05 series of RTIC and the 0 0.06 is every resource accessed with a few exceptions requires critical sections or in, in this case it uses locks which uses a mutex um, that means that everything you're locking requires the mutex support uh, and when you try and do that with these that doesn't work partially because of this uh, lifetime classification among other things so by using the task local that solved it and enabled me to get past the issues with trying to lock and failing to lock these components when I use them um, the rest is the same uh, in it is the same I don't think I've changed anything here oh yes there is one thing in it always now returns late resources even if they're empty it also returns this other thing called in it monotonics we're not going to cover that here we'll look at that at some later point um, so that's another change but I mean we were change we were returning late resources anyhow uh, so I've just added in it monotonics so there's it returns a tuple now two items the late resources and the monotonics um, I've got idle in here as well I think there's some changes with that I'm trying to work out whether you can actually use resources in idle it's kind of saying that you can't but the text is ambiguous we'll come back to that for our purposes it's not useful at the moment anyhow now the bit where we have it go off and talk to the FPGA not programming the FPGA but afterwards I've created one of these soft tasks for okay you can tell it's a soft task because it's called task and it doesn't have a bind um, parameter in it because a bind parameter normally indicates that it's binding to you know a hardware interrupt um, and we're passing in these resources thinking about it I don't actually need to pass those resources in anymore um, that was one of the other changes hold on I will soon tell you so let me remove said resources Save that and run it. Uh, no, that's not the case. You'd all have to do that. Okay. Any props? Why did I think we didn't have to do that anymore? Anyhow. Um, so this this task here is a soft task we call it manage we have to call it something else because it's a crap name we are now loading okay uh, the resources in so we're loading the soft spy resource right and the program boolean but we are not before we would be loading a kind of uh, mutable reference or reference to a mutable resource directly but that's not what's happening here what's being passed in is a proxy for the resource that does support mutexes as I was reminded by Laurie after he read the uh, description um, because what we're going to do now is in order to access these particular things we need to do it safely which means accessing them in a critical section because these could be being changed or manipulated or mutated um, with the hardware interrupt for example now in this case I haven't set the hardware interrupt priority high enough for that to happen however I should do um, so here what you have is this is calling a lock not on one of the items which is what you normally do but because I need access not only to the program boolean but also to the spy soft spy structure um, I need to get both of them now if I was to do that normally I'd have to do a lock on programmed and then I'd have to do another lock 
on spy inside that so I'd have two nested locks now the way that these locks work is they use a closure you can tell it's a closure because of this okay so you're passing this in as a closure this activity to the lock so if I wanted to do two locks you know for these two individually I'd have one of these nested in another one so you can imagine what's going to happen it's going to go wider and wider across the page it's going to get more and more complicated to look at so they've got this uh, multi-lock support which basically you put the different things you want to lock in the tuple and then you call lock on that tuple and it's basically syntactic sugar for doing the nesting okay so by doing this lock using this closure we then can get hold of rather than the proxies the actual um referenced mutable muted muting mutating um um resources programmed in this case in spy so we can go off and do our stuff so first we say is if it's programmed you know has it been programmed because we don't want to be transferring a you know our bytes to the FPGA if it hasn't been programmed yet. A, because uh, the synthesis isn't running inside the FPGA. Secondly, it may be in the process of programming, right? Uh, and we certainly wouldn't want to start using the spy when that's happening. So that's what the protection is. So if it's programmed, we then go in, uh, it's just a simple for loop that goes from zero to 15 effectively. And it sends that value of count with a hundred millisecond um, delay between the two different things. So that's what that does. Before we, I think yesterday when we were looking at that, we had that just after the pull. So when it finished programming, and this is how we're calling or we're spawning that task because we are spawning the task, and that's slightly different because you, especially if the um, priorities of the things are different okay and that's spawned from here nice and simple this part hasn't changed except we don't have to tell it that we're spawning these because you don't have to tell it that now because they're global spawns what do I mean by that manage is seen as a global thing that we're doing a, a kind of static spawn on here that's different the way that you call the spawn from how you would have done in the previous version uh, yeah and this doesn't change except we have to have a lock on the things that we're changing so in this now the resources that we're accessing during the programming are header to detect whether we got the header or not byte count i.e. the number of bytes we transferred when we're programming the FPGA programmed which will be false until we've programmed it and SPI, which is access to the soft SPI uh, structure and resources. Okay. And that is it. So it's not that different. But it does run. So let's show you that running. Uh, so I'm going to do this first. It's going to build it. Um, the other thing I had to do is I had to make some updates to the cargo file as well, and I can show you those in a minute. Just show you it running. Um, I have to run putty again because it's bloody Windows. Use my language. Annoyingly. That gets everything hunky dory for us. We can then go back into Linux. You can set the TTY access. Okay. <laughs> Don't do that. Hold on. Um, and then I'm going to program it. I'm just going to send it the trail example first. So if you have a look up here at the uh, top right hand corner, you'll see 
Um, none of the LEDs on right now. But now I'm going to load the trial program. What the hell is wrong with my terminal? Too many odd stuff. There we go. Okay, that's programmed and it's running the trail program. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my other window with MMyGen in. So let's just swap the windows here. Um, Remember, this was our NMIGEN stuff we did yesterday. Uh, one thing that I did do is I swapped around uh, in the um, ICE file, sorry, the ICE core uh, board file. I swapped the mozzie and meso directions because they're one way around because I want it as a slave because it's as a slave. Um, the rest is the same. So if I now run this, this should reprogram. So again, if you look in the top right hand corner as well, when I run this, you should see a small count occur after it comes out of programming. There you go. And that's finished. And then it leaves all the LEDs on. <clears throat> so that counts from 0 to 15. Run it again so you can see it again. <coughs> programming. There you go. It's finished programming. Now it's doing the count. I know it's difficult to see, but it's, it's something. So what we now have magically is... Um, our Rust side is working, it's working with a new RTIC 0.6, the USB is working, programming the FPGA is working, and programming from Python and NMIGEN is working. Um, not only that, but the NMIGEN script for an SPI slave is receiving the count number that's being sent to it, 0 to 15, and it is showing it the um, least significant four bits of that. Uh, to drive the LEDs, which is why you see the count count up after the programming. Ah, marvelous, very good. So, uh, where does that leave us now? The next step, I guess, is probably um, getting it to work not with the spy that we use for programming, the soft. Bitbank spy, but the um, QSPI, because there is a second connection, remember, between the STM32 and the ICE40 uh, HX. Um, the first one is for programming and flash. The second connection is really just dedicated for communication between the FPGA and the uh, STM32. That connection is arranged as a dual SPI using a QSPI mode. So QSPI um, can use up to six pins or it can use four pins. If you go to six pins, which we couldn't in this case because it's not implemented on that particular F764 pin device, um, that would enable you to transfer nibbles. That's why it's called quad SPI. But there are two other modes. There is dual SPI. So that sends two bits at a time, which we can do using four pins. Um, basically, the Mozi and MISO become um, either send data bit 0 and 1 or receive data bit 0 and 1. You still have the clock, you still have the chip select. And then the other QSPI mode is just normal one bit mode, where MISO and Mozi are MISO and Mozi. So the idea is today is we get that QSPI working at least in SPI mode with our SPI slave. What that's going to involve is change, adding the pinouts for the QSPI into the MIGEN slave example. 
and using those pins rather than the SPI ones that use for programming. Uh, that's on the end MyGen side, in other words, the side that we're creating the SPI slave synthesis for in the hardware, in the FPGA. And then on the uh, STM32 side, i.e. the Rust side, what we need to do is start using the QSPI library um, with the other set of pins that the QSPI is available to for and wired with um, in terms of its connection to the FPGA. Hot chocolate tea, I am not convinced. That is weird. So that's where we are, that's what we're gonna do. Any questions before we knuckle down and start with that particular one? Mm -hmm. Once you're thinking about asking anything, I will um, knock my nuts over. I will uh, start finding, I need a circuit diagram for the ICE 40 because we need to look at that. Whilst you're having a think about any questions that you wish to ask. Uh, here we go. Also, whilst you're thinking about that, I'm just going to take the top off. This hoodie's a bit warm. Right, good, good, good. So nobody asking anything? Okay, good, let's move on then. <clears throat> um, which should we do first? Let's have a look at the circuit diagram first. Cover that. Um, So this is the circuit diagram for ice core. On the left, on the left here, maybe difficult to see my cursor there. On the left here, um, you've got the STM32, and then on the right slash top, you've got the FPGA. So you can see the FCK MISO MOSI lines that we've been using. Here and those connecting here. Now, what we're going to need to use um, are some slightly different pins. We are going to need to use. Let's put it down there for a sec. Oh. Hold on, let me just scroll this. Seems to have moved itself somewhat. So I'm just going to put some notes here about the pins. 
So uh, QSPI pins. Let me just write these down. We have um, IO zero. which is pin 73 on the FPGA. And on the STM32, hold on. Can I tab on this? Probably not. So on the STM32, the IO pin, IO0 is off screen. Of course it is. Hold on. Right. What did I call it? IO0. Yeah. IO0 is. PC nine, PC nine, and then I oh, I O one is uh, PC ten for the FTM thirty two. And for the FPGA, it's pin 74. Okay. Uh, the next line is DCS. DCS or not DCS even and that's pin 75 and DCS connects to the STM32 PB6. There. Sorry. PB6. <sighs> PB6. And then finally, we've got uh, DSCK, which is the clock. D. SCK and that is seventy six on the FPGA and on the STM thirty two it's um, PB one I think. Oh, wow, well, no, PB2, I think that's misnumbered on there. I think it's PB2. PB2, I think. I'd better check that. That's annoying. That's not clear on the circuit diagram. Interesting. In twenty seven. Hmm. Ah, uh, hold your horses. Let me quickly check the data sheet on that because that's rather odd. Um.
27 is PV2. Let me just check the functionality on PV2. Quad FBI clock. Dash to one. Cool. Right, we have the info we need. Let's go back. Um, first of all, let's just split that to the right and look at ice core. Do we have a resource for this? We do not. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We do not. So, um, what we need is to do something like this. Let's um, move that over there. So, I'm going to copy this here. And then we're going to use the same names for. Oh, I can't use the same names. Damn. Um, what am I going to use? Let's use the ones that we're using here. So D S C K. Um, D C S. And Mozzie and Miso are different. And the missile are. I don't know which way around to do this. Um, let's just say uh, D zero ooh, and D one. Um, Right, pin wise, D S C K seventy oh one D S C K seventy six and that's definitely in D C S seventy five most definitely in D zero is both directions D D O 73 and uh, <laughs> DD1 74. Do I have to express direction here? Um, so in this case, 
I'm expecting DD0 to be mozzie. Is that right? Master X zero in. Ooh, can't remember which way round the DD0 and DD1s would be. Um, Let me just check something. Um, mozzie is normally IO zero. To serial in, in this case. That would be input. And this would be output. DD1 being attached. So if it was attached to a flash, where the flash is slave, MISO would be zero, 01, and that would be serial out from the slave. I think that's right. I must remember this. Okay. Um, I'm going to need to just reinstall those. and reinstall them. Okay. So in this case, what I'm going to do, let me just copy those. So the only one that's output is DD1. I'm just going to mark that so I don't forget. OK. 
okay so if we go back to our script here this is where we pull them in so I'm going to copy that and then I'm going to just comment that temporarily and now I'm going to go like that so my um, The mozzie is your one out here, which is DD1. SCK is going to be DSCK. It's going to be DCS. And this is going to be DD0. So what happens then if I now run this? Okay, it seems to have run okay. So as far as I know, that's now running on the um, on the ice core inside the ice 40 HX PGA so let's switch now to um, the other um, to the rust side of things doo, doo, doo. why can I never find stuff on this list is just so damn long So we're going to need to create a new resource. Um, we're going to need some extra pins. What are we going to need? Um, let's look at the ports. Let's do port B first. So port B, we're using port B. We're using port B here and here. So let's add to this. Let's create these. Gonna need two. Um, two from port B, uh, DD1. Uh, one and um, DSCK. Okay, and these are going to be respectively. So DD one, DD one was PD six. DD. Sorry, TSK is PB2. Okay. Um, we might not need all of these, by the way. I'll come back to that in a minute. And then the other ones are part of port C. So where's our port C device? It's down here. And one minute, so DD1 is a different one. It's one that's been given. This is actually an out um, and input. I'm going to change these in a second. Let me just separate those two because this is going to be wrong. I'll come back to that in a sec. Um, so let's take a copy. We need two of these. Um, and then this needs to be 
I need to be mutable. I don't think so. This needs to be called, right, let's do the first one is PC9, which is DD0. And that's PC9. Oops. And then the last one was PC10, which was PCS, right? Now, those are not just push pulls, these are special functions, these are alternate functions. Okay, um, the alternate function, I'm just going to look out. Right, alternate function. So, what do we want first? We want, let's do pb6, pb6, pb6 alternate functions. Uh, okay, pb6, quad spi, mcs. Oh, that seems wrong. PB6 is NCS. It's alternate function AF10. So let's do that. AF10. There we go. But that should be DCS. PB6 should be DCS. So this is different for how I've named them on the FPGA. Oh my goodness, this is going to be crazy. According to the chart, that is NCS, so that will be DCS. Right, I'm going to rewrite this PB6. Let's call it DCS here. So I think this is right and my circuit diagram has named them incorrectly. Uh, PB2, PB2 mode AF9, and that's a clock, so that's right. <laughs> AF9, I mean, the date sheet could be wrong, of course. Um, then let's have a look at PC9, 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 quad SPI, IO0, which is AF9, IO0, so this is right, uh, quad SPI, AF9, Okay, and then 
DCS, so it's not going to be DCS anymore, is it? It's going to be DD1, right? Um, PC10. PC10. Alternate function AF9. Yeah, that's data line 1. Interesting. So my schematic is wrong, or this data sheet is wrong. And I want alternate nine. Did I say nine? Yeah. No, PC ten. PC ten. Should be DD one, right? PC nine should be DD zero. And DSCK or PB two. Should be DSCK. These are going to go, have to go back and fix that stuff. Anyhow, don't let me forget to go back and fix that. Now the other thing we're going to need is the um, SPI library, right? Did anyone use DSPI on the Black Ice MX, Laurie asks. Uh, yes, there was one. Um, yes, uh, what was it? Hold on. I remember it. Bear with me. Um, somebody did it. Uh, Andy Cat did, but I'm just thinking that's an old one. Maybe that was. Um... There's this thread, but I think there's a newer one somewhere, I seem to recall. Oh, you already found that. Um, I think there was another one as well. Someone was doing, I think, some audio stuff or something like that. Anyhow. Um, right. Back to the code. Right. What was I going to do? Right. I need to look at the how. Bear with me. Uh, I thought I had this open in a tab, but I can't see him. To find it, bear with me. Too many tabs. 
that have I done? All right, let's do it this way. Um, STM 32F hmm, 7. How? Right, let's have a look in examples. Let's have a look at uh, Um, right. We need to bring in some functionality. I guess we do it here. We are going to need uh, GSBI. And we're going to need within that, I think, these. We need to set it up also. We need Something like this. I'm just copying and pasting for the moment. Uh, I'll do
Hmm. Oh, this could be complicated. Peripheral or SPI. Hold on. I need to check what these sizes are as well. Address size, size. That's the number of bits, I guess. Address size. The number of bytes. Oh, this is like setting up for a flash. Um, this may have some complications. This driver. Um, okay. Um, Dun, 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 dun. Let me just also look at the library. How? Source. QSPI. Uh, address size. U8. Address size for all transactions. You wait. Okay. Um. QSPI width. New, right, so I need to pass in RCC, QSPI, size, mutational add size, not sure what that is. So size is log to flash size in bytes. Oh, okay. Well, we don't need anything like that address space. Uh, sorry, size is log two. That would be 16 megabyte. We don't need that. We only need eight, I think. Um, this is going to be tricky. Add size is the number of bytes. Uh, 
number of bytes needed to specify the address. Well, that would normally be one, but yeah. So then add size is one or more. And also the add size is four or more. Hmm, what else do we need to pass in? Um, mode. I guess, why? How do we set the mode? Hmm. What I'm not sure about here is um, this is kind of complicated. There is a mode, but do we not set the mode somehow? It doesn't seem to accept it as passed in. There's a QSPI width as well. QSPI transactions contain configurable instructions address and data fields. Use these constants for the width fields in QSPI transaction. Hmm. That's a transaction changes the width. But don't we need something to part don't we need to pass the pins in? Hold on. Let's let me just go back. Mm, examples, there's an example in here where somebody uses this. Um do 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 try the ID Oh, hold on. That is very odd. You have to create a QSPI transaction that wraps this stuff up, which is interesting.
So the simplest example in there is is one that shows um, check ID. So that sends an instruction and then does I think two reads. Um, if it was talking to a flash, so that's quite a simple one. But in our case, we want to just send a whole bunch of data. I don't know if there is a transaction. So when you make a transaction, it looks something like this. Um, Let's just create something here to put this in. I can see this is going to be a little fun. Task. Right. Uh, we're going to need to do this, aren't we? So, yeah. Better not use that, actually. Hmm. This is what a transaction looks like. Address width none. Data width. Wait a minute. ISP width. There's no instruction in this case. Just none, dummy data length. Well, that could be say sixteen in our case, couldn't it? Data width. Is this the data width we're sending? Single to SPI width. I width. Is that instruction width and data width and address width? Single. None. Single. That could be none. And that could be none. Hmm. Right. Um, and then when they use this, they do and the next time they use it, they do something like this. So there's their array. transaction ID
they're checking the return of ID, aren't they? Yeah. ID, is that what's returned? I guess. Um. I mean, what are we calling this driver? putting a lock on this at the moment hold on we're only going to use it in this function this task so that is going to be <laughs> One of these. Right. Okay. I need to do something to set up the pins, don't I? How do we deal with the pins? need to come back to that I'm not sure if that's the right thing so that's a polling read it should maybe I need to, there's a read DMA write DMA check ID hold on write DMA no I don't want to do that I just want to keep things simple write block polling right Mm. 
So there's a polling right buff transaction unwrap. Buff transaction unwrap. That's a more generic form, by the way. Rather than ID. Instruction width. So I wonder if that can be none, because this isn't an instruction, it's just a transfer. Data width single. Instruction. Could that be none? Dummy not some data length. That's weird. Just max address. Data width is definitely single. No instruction. I can't find an example that doesn't have an instruction. That's annoying. So I'm not sure what I set this to, but this is effectively none, I guess. That might complain. Data length, well, that will be however many bytes this is. Uh, which, what did I want? 15, was it? Hold on, so what did I want? I wanted what? I just use a range here normally. Can I do that? In Rust? Anyone now? I bet you can. Rather than writing it out manually like this. Nope. I are not counting. If that was the case, well, oh, hmm, no, I don't want to do this. I want to do this. Oh, I want to do this 16 times with a delay in between, don't I? Oh. So these transactions are designed to send multiple bytes, not individual ones. Uh, hmm. I wonder if there's a rule. Right. Bear with me a sec, folks. Eyes are looking at the implementation here to see if I can get any clues. 
there is here's my width, here's my mode. QS by width can be none, single dual or quad. Yeah. QSPI mode, indirect write, indirect read, auto polling, memory map. Uh, I don't know, indirect right, I guess. Um, so there's new QSPI. Okay. QSPI. How does it define its pins? I guess it doesn't. Um, where? DMA read, DMA write, no, we don't want to do that. It's got a polling read and a polling write. Set up transaction. DR address. Hmm. There isn't a simple write. So what does a polling write do? Set up transaction, match transaction data link. Okay, well, I think we're just going to have to do it manually. It seems daft having to use a transaction, but there we go. Um, hmm. So it's expecting a buffer. But this would normally so that's going to confuse things tremendously so we're going to do same thing here that we did Is going to be a little awkward. But we have red count, didn't we? Uh, we do that. Use of nude value. We don't have to create this multiple times. I'm going to have to wrap this as well. Um, Do this after it's programmed, obviously. Otherwise, well, it's going to be stupid if we do that. Uh, 
Um, Maybe I have to take that, <sighs> put that in here. Uh, it seems to accept that. I'm not sure about this though. Shouldn't that be... something like that but it would also need a delay as well which I haven't included in here I wonder how you set up the speed and stuff just taking a slight aside here before I continue because I'm going to take a comfort break very shortly. What's the time? 20 plus nearly at uh, 9 o'clock. Been streaming now for just under two hours. Um, one of the things we have to be careful of here is the clock we're providing to the FPGA when it's running is coming from the master clock out which we can't yet fully configure. We have to take its default frequency, which happens to be 16 megahertz. That means that the sampling clock, when it resyncs the SPI slave input, is only running at 16 megahertz. So we've got to make damn sure that we don't run our SPI too fast, otherwise it's going to completely mess up. Normally what you do is you'd have a PLL taking that uh, clock in, that master clock in, and then banging that up to like 100 megahertz or something so that your sampling rate is you know nice and high inside the fpga but that means setting up a pll which we could do however there are some issues with that once you start setting up pll's you can't do that in normal regular verilog what you have to use is the manufacturer based instances uh, which I'd have to look up and find out how to do in NMYGEN. I know you can do it, I've just not done it. Um, and the trouble is that that can be chip or therefore board specific. So I don't know how you do that in a um, consistent way. <coughs> in a consistent way because. Um, 
if you think about it. Um, different boards may have different MCO outputs from the microcontroller and they'll have different F PLL configurations inside because it varies from chip to chip how you set these PLLs up. <coughs> One possibility is <coughs> you could build some base frequency PLL support maybe into the NMIGEN board file. So you could request the frequency, it then works it out and returns the PLL or some such. I haven't looked at that yet. <coughs> I don't know what other people are doing on that front. Right, so let's just take a quick uh, comfort break and then we'll come back to this um, to this code.
back again. Um, Laurie has kindly sent me a um, a link about the PLL. Let's have a look at this. Let me um, turn this on for you guys so you can see the uh, browser. Enmigen example from the Enmigen lib. PLL class PLL. What does it say here? Instantiate the ice forties phase lock loop. This uses the ice forties SB PLL forty pad primitive. That's the, what I was referring to as instances in Verilog or vendor specific instances. Um, the reference clock is directly connected to the package pin. <sighs> To allocate that pin, request the pin with DIR equals, otherwise mmigen inserts SBIO on the pin. Because the PLL eats the external clock, that clock is not available for other uses. So you might as well have the PLL generate the default sync clock domain. This module also has a reset synchronizer. The domain's reset line is not released until a few clocks after the PLL signal is good so what do we have to pass in frequency in frequency out domain name by default equals sync which is that's that's the default um domain for margin clock domain well that's quite cool you just pass in your source frequency the frequency that you want um, and you don't pass in the pin um, shouldn't you pass in the pin self dot port count frequency so it's internal it's got an elaborate function here PLL lock PLL instance so this is where it's creating the um, instance how does it know which pad that is Self domain name. Don't quite get how it knows which pin to which. Laurie says I've never used it. He gave me the link, but he hasn't used it. Um, nor have I. Looks easy enough. I don't know whether we'll bother trying that tonight, but I will be trying that at some point in the near future, definitely. I can't quite see how you set the clock pin. It's saying here the reference clock is directly connected to the package pin. To allocate a pin, request the pin with dir equals dash. Otherwise, a mygen inserts an sp on the pin.
Mm. I will have a look at that. Thank you. That's helpful. I'm not going to complicate things with it now, but uh, generally that's good. Um, Um, one thing that I'm thinking about then is how do we set up the frequency of this um, uh, SPI? Can we set up the frequency? More importantly, I'm just having a look now through the stuff. So this is the um, this is something that uses the QSPI. What I probably need to do actually is just go to the actual source of the QSPI itself. Uh, does it say anything here about the speed? USB and transaction description. So at the top here, it doesn't say anything. So we pass in QSBI, which is the peripheral. This line is to configure the QSPI flash. This is obviously designed for flash. They're not imagining it being used elsewhere. We're kind of hijacking it in our kind of really wacky way here. Uh, later when we use it, we'll be using it more like we'd use it with QSPI flash, i.e. we'll be sending an address and then data. <clears throat> but for now, just to get the LEDs working, what we're trying to do is just send some bytes. Enable Quad SPI in RC. This is interesting. So RCC HB modify QSPI set bit. So that's configuring the. I was enabling the Quad SPI clock, presumably. But I can't see anything about. Um, right here we go. Single flash mode with QSPI clock prescaler of two that's 216 divided by two equals 108 megahertz five phone threshold only matter for dma set to four set the device size size where does size come from There. Size is the log two flash size in bytes. Really? Set the device size. Okay, whatever. Um, has seen. Are they saying that they're running this at 108 megahertz? I mean, it's entirely possible it will go up to that. That would be a little past for us. Um, w prescaler dot bits one. TH threshold dot bits three dot en dot set bit
So are we setting just one of the bits or are we setting several? Bit one FTH Meshart. Bits one. Yeah, I'd have to know more about which bits were set for the clock prescaler. Um, let me have a quick look at something. Hold on. See so if I can get any clues from the um, clock diagram. And if we go to the data sheet, where were we? Let's have a look at the clock. No. Uh, this might not have the detail in that we need. Uh, these are just top line things, they're not. Um, is there a clock diagram here? Yeah, I don't think this is going to give us the um, information. Um, hold on. Just going to run this. This tends to take quite a lot of memory. It's not very efficient. But you oh, it's kind of download all the stuff now. Oh, hateful piece of software. They're very rude to its users. Right, S T M thirty two F. Seven three zero LQFP sixty four start project. I'm just going to have a peek at the clock configuration. Just start the um, clock up. So this is an external high speed. And enable quad SPI. PB2 is definitely clock. PB6 is definitely. NCS. That's confirmation from the data sheet, by the way. Um, clock configuration.
I'm just looking at a diagram. Where does the QSPI get its clock? So two clock I two C clock I two C two SD MMC. Hmm. So it's taking it directly off P clock, I guess. Or is it Sys clock? If I go into the configuration parameter settings, clock prescaler. BIFO threshold, that's what the threshold was. So what can a clock doesn't really give me much information. Clock pre-scaler pre goes up to 255. <clears throat> so if we're setting bit one, uh, okay. hmm. yes, that's not really very helpful. Let me get rid of that. Um, one place we can look is in the clock setup. Let me just run just have a quick peek at the code from my storm. Um, Um, main. Let's have a look. I want to look at the quad SPI in it. Can't remember how I set this up. Whether in fact I did edit. Let me just find. <clears throat> Clock prescaler equals tool. Um, I don't know what that means in terms of the registers, though. Can I look this up? Go to definition. Oh, this is interesting. Let me show you this, guys. This is um, There's a nice little diagram here. So I'm looking at uh, the STM32 source code. It's used underneath. So I'm looking at their uh, HAL for QSPI, which I'm calling on in my MyStorm firmware. 
this is quite nice the way this this the clock prescaler 32-bit register this represents um, this parameter can be any number between 0 and 255 So effectively, that's indicating bits here. So if you set the if you set that entire register to zero, I don't know what that would mean. What would, what would zero mean? Uh, they're setting bit one, which would make you think divide by one. Right, so if we wanted to divide by more, we'd need to change the bit number that it was setting. Right, that's my guess. But I'm trying to think what would zero mean in the divide register? It seems illegal to me. Oh no, no, setting bit one is divide by two, setting to zero is divide by one, i.e., no division yes yes right i'm going to get rid of that as i got it i think i know where it's coming from so if we go back to this uh, where's the window i've lost my bruiser this one That's what we we're looking at here. So the prescaler is setting bit one, right? Clock prescaler of two, two sixteen divided by two. So what we could do is we could effectively change that. So rather than setting bit one, if we set bit two, then we would be running at two. That would be four. So we'd be running at you know fifty-four megahertz. If we set bit three, we'd be running at that'd be divided by eight. Isn't it? Let's divide by two. Bit two will be divided by four. Bit three will be divided by eight. Um, it should be twenty seven. And if we set um, bit four, then it'd be divided by sixteen. So we'd be operating at what? Uh, 12.5 megahertz. 26 divided by 16 equals 13.5 megahertz. Bit four. So we might actually have to go to setting bit five. Blimey. Um, That's a problem because we'd have to go in and change the source and use a local copy of the source. Hmm. It's a shame they don't make that available as part of the library. Part of the configuration.
I guess they're just keeping things simple, right? Um, okay, so I've got to think about that. So that's how we're going to need to set the clock. We're going to have to change the source code on the how. I uh, don't really want to do that. But we can do that if push comes to shove. The other alternative is to get the HX PLL up. Um, but we'd need to operate at more than twice the sampling, twice the clock frequency. That would be more than 216 megahertz, which may be a little excessive inside the uh, ICE 40. I can't remember. Hold on. Let me bring the browser back up so you can see what I'm saying here. Um, apologies, folks. So what I was just looking at there, just so that you can see. is this here, these bits. You have to chain that to bits five. Um, so the could we even run that fast reliably inside? Inside the ice forty. Probably all right on the HX. Um, might not be such a good idea on the others. I'm sure the PLL will be fine. Input clock frequency, well I don't need to worry about output clock frequency. Max is 275 megahertz. So we want that as the as close to that as possible really. Um Meow, 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 meow. However, trying to run the SPI logic at that speed might be a problem. Uh, so the PLL was fine. Um, not external, we want the internal switch characteristics. Sio buffer performance. Is that what we want? Signals. PLL and global functions.
Register to register performance. Oh, that's the LP devices wanting the HX. Yeah, so the slowest out of that would be for something like a 16 bit add, it would be 220. 64 bit, that's because you're chaining lots of LUTs. Um, that's worrying. Hello, Twinkle. Hmm. I mean, we're not taking this output, but we are bringing the clock in the SPI clock. General one global clocks F max G buff. Is this in? Global clock buffer was skewed. Mind you, we're only taking 16 megs in, but our SPI would be up at 108. That should be fine. Oh, wait a minute, this is picoseconds. Frequency for the global clock, 275, that's not a problem. Ah, uh, IO parameters, global clock buffer with PLO. input frequency. Are uh, you trying to tell me something, Twinkle? I'm going to say hello to everyone here. Hair is friendly, friendly cats. And Twinkles. What are you after, Twinks? Hmm? One out. Is that what you want? Where do you want to go through there? Where do you want to go? This way? Um, I seriously doubt that but even though it's capable of doing this, I am seriously doubt. Wait a minute, what's this? Input clock frequency FN. So that's the PLL. Hmm. 
Gendalio pin primitive skew. Mathematics two seventy five. It's external switching characteristics, but is that referring to in? Why does it say global clocks? Are those like the worst case? <laughs> so it might be able to deal with that frequency coming in, but would the logic do so? Right, let me, um, if I remember rightly, I don't think our model will cope with that it's not been optimized at all let me get rid of the browser i'll show you what i mean oh, right. if we switch to uh in my gen Um, now, when we do a build here, I think it saves some stuff from the build. Um, question is, file, no, no. No, not the IL. Um, crikey, what was it? Timing, this one. When it does the build, it does a kind of basic timing analysis in the open source tools. So it tells you how quickly it thinks something can um, handle. So here, max frequency for clock. Pass at 25. Oh, I bloody hate so. Um, what? Why does it say 307 megahertz? Max frequency for clock 307. It says pass at 25, probably because I've provided 25 as the default. But it reckons it has got to 307.6 megahertz. This is based on timing diagrams, not actually the internal, it's just a guess. Hold on. It normally does more than one of these. This one says 230. I forget what the difference is by, between these two. Is one maximized for size or something and the other maximized for speed? Or something like that, I can't remember. Critical path report. Yeah, it's, 
day, and then seven. Well, because it's very simple at the moment, because it's only SPI one bit. Although this is significantly less. The more logic you add in, the slower it gets. Because we do it very simple. Um, God. That leaves me with a bit of a dilemma. Do we change? Our choices seem to be do we change the how, which is damn awkward to do, because it doesn't give us any control over the clock. There's no options when you set the QSPI up. Or or do we set the PLL up for 200 odd plus you know 230 megahertz internally which seems slightly ambitious but I've never really pushed these HX chips to see what what happens because normally the logic is much more complex and that kind of frequency doesn't make sense. Because hmm. we could certainly do that. Um, certainly give it a try. Oh, this is a pain. I didn't think about this. Excuse me, I need protein. Um, I'm not sure we're going to finish this tonight. Already two and maybe three hours in. Normally when you bring these peripherals up, what you want to do is lower the frequency right down to start with. Then optimise. Otherwise you're asking for trouble nine times out of ten. Which is making me think that we need to find a way to change that clock. Hold on, let me go back. I feel much more comfortable changing the QSPI clock speed. <clears throat> Um, I went in the browser, wasn't it? Turn the browser back on. That, can I fire that off after it's been configured? It's going to do that when it's new. <clears throat> I think I'm going to have to have a think about it. And it may involve some playing about. Hmm. Um. 
Right with, right with zero. Sorry, you can't see this. Right with zero. That's where you're setting the pre-scanner. Um, I'm just trying to remember how this works. I think actually bits means I can pass a number in. It's not the bit number. That's actually the value. If you're setting several bits at once, so it converts that to a value. So we can numerically set the value. It's a shame they don't make it a parameter. Wouldn't be difficult. Right, I'm going to have a think about that. I'm not going to do it now because it's too late, I think. Uh, sorry, folks. This is going to be more difficult. Uh, I'm not even going to try and run it right now because it's just going to be too fast. Pretty sure. Um, I wonder what happens if I actually... Let me get rid of this. I'll come back to that in a bit anyhow. See if what we've got actually compiles probably won't because I haven't done everything, have I? See what we're missing. Right. Near field resources on type. Right, so um, let's just fix these little things that we're here. CX, is it not resources? Uh, is that because I haven't mentioned any and I need to <laughs> probably what are we going to need we don't need SPI we do need programmed and we do need this one What else is wrong? Unknown fill programs. Yeah, well, we've just covered that. Mismatch type instruction none. Expected you out. Yeah, expected you ain't found. Hmm, 273. That's my transaction, isn't it? 
273. So it doesn't like none. Instruction. So it doesn't like not having an instruction. Oh. I'll just give that zero then. Does it matter when I put that? Because I've said instruction width is none, so dumb is zero, so maybe that's what I do there. What else have we got? Okay. Let's just check again then. Uh, ooh, got a whole crap load of issues here. And use variable DCS. And I got unused for all of those. Yeah. I can fix those. So basically, although I'm setting the um, setting these things, I'm not actually using the pins because I'm just setting the alternate functions. That's just the weirdness that comes with this. I'm actually interacting with the peripheral rather than the pins themselves. Um, That should sort that out. By putting the underscore before them, you're saying I don't care about this value. I cannot borrow programmed as mutable. 264. Cannot borrow as mutable. I'm not changing. I'm not changing it. It's strange because in the one above here, I'm not bringing it in as mutable. So why does it want me? make it mutable yeah maybe it's because that's in the tuple right so what happens if I say that does it make any difference oh, yeah passes uh, I'm not going to run it now because it's pointless I know it won't work Interestingly, none of my pins are on. When did those go off? That's strange. Um, okay. So it's kind of ready to rock and roll. I was spawning this, I could spawn that maybe. I don't know what that would tell me, of course. But it might be fun to see what it says.
This means it definitely isn't going to work, I'm sure. But let's do it anyhow. Uh, let's just set the um, STTY up. Let's just send a normal blink file program. Yeah, that programs. Let's just switch to the M Migen. Hold on. I'll keep you with me, folk. What? Just turn the browser off. Hold on. So we're just going to run this now. All right, so programming. It's finished programming and there are no LEDs on. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, um, the other thing is it won't work because we've swapped the pins, haven't we? Got about that, excuse my French. Um, what were the pins here? What did I say? So the ones that are different are DD1 is actually DCS. So if I go and have a look at um, this so D C S that doesn't change D D one that is changed so that's actually D C S D D one is actually D C S D D one is actually D C S so D D one and D C S are swapped right So DSK is the same, DCS is 75, DD1 is 74, and DD0 is 73. Well that looks right. What, 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 what? Hold on. D, D, 1, 74, 74. DCS 75. D, 0. <laughs> But are my inputs and outputs right? So, what was it? DD0, I thought. DD0 is I0, is D0. That's serial in. The other one that's different is the serial out, which is DD1. 74. So that should be right. So that means I actually entered them in incorrectly somehow. 
but they happen to be right. What? What, 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 what? That is very strange to do. Did I make a mistake? There's something else we have to do that I'd forgotten about. So that kind of looks right, but I mean, I wouldn't know if it's working or not because they're just so fast. Um, something else I forgot about. When they configure the pins, in the SPI, Meow. Let me go through. Something else they do when they're running at high speed, they set it up on the pins. So um, I'll just show you what I mean here. Let me turn the browser back on. So that you can see, I just cover this base. I'm just covering all the loose end bits because um, may as well make use of the time. So in the implementation here, the other thing they're doing, not just in alternate, they're doing pull-ups and they're doing set speed very high on all of them which we're not doing so let's just do that as well whilst I think about it it might catch us out when we do the other stuff Just what I remember. Oh, damn it. And the speed very high. I need to import something for that, don't I? GPIO speed. GPIO speed. Oh, damn it. Really? Whilst I'm there, I don't think this will make any difference because it's still not going to damn well work at that speed. But I may as well, just for the giggles.
Program the trial program. Yeah, that's working. Just switch to the uh, running the uh, BMX spy script. It runs, but yeah, no LEDs. I'm not surprised, given that it's running at 16 megahertz. Um, What I might try and do for a laugh, rather than mess around with the clock, is I might try and get that PLL working. That's a kind of good Saturday morning task when I'm feeling fresh, maybe. Okay, that will do for now, folks. Um, let me just stop this. Don't remember. Um, Probably won't stream again until uh, let me think, next Wednesday. Um, maybe do some more of this. We'll see how it goes. Um, I'll probably be on Discord between now and, well, not this evening, but from tomorrow through to Wednesday as well. So if I start having some joy uh, with that part of it, I'll, uh, I'll let you know. And then I'll also decide what we're going to do give you some kind of notice about what we're going to cover on on Wednesday but that would do thank you for joining me tonight folks it's been interesting um, and I will uh, either see you down on discord or on the forum or I will speak to you um, on Wednesday at 8 p.m. the normal uh, streaming time Thank you uh, for joining me. Ciao.